Good evening. I'm Gloria Jones Johnson, Director of Women's and Gender Studies Program here at Iowa State University. I'd like to welcome you to our program tonight. Our guest lecturers tonight are Lynn Cox and Dr. Gabriela Mioto, and they're going to talk on From Athlete to Adventure Writer. Tonight's event is part of the 35th anniversary celebration of the Women's and Gender Studies Program uh, celebration for the year. In addition, there are several other sponsors of tonight's lectures, and it really underscores um, the um, uh, a ground root praise of, uh, of, of uh, having these people, uh, remarkable women, visit with us this, this, these past two days. So the other co-sponsors tonight are the Athletic Department, Biological Sciences Club, Ecology, Evolution, and Organismal Biology, English, Environmental Studies, Kinesiology, Kinesiology and Health Club, LAS Miller Lecture Fund, MFA Program in Creative Writing and the Environment, Marine Biology Club, Pre-Medical Professions Club, the Vagina Warriors, Women and Gender Studies Program, Writer's Block, and the Committee on Lectures, funded by GSB. Let me tell you a little bit about our, our uh, guest tonight. Lynn Cox competed, completed her first open water swim at age 14 when she swam across the Catalina Channel, 27 miles, with a group of teenagers from Seal Beach, California. In 1972, at age 15, Lynn swam across the English Channel and shattered the men's and women's world records with a time of nine hours and 57 minutes. She was the first person to perform many swims worldwide, including across the 42 degree Fahrenheit waters of the Strait of Magellan between three of the Aleutian Islands around the Cape of Good Hope and 1.2 miles in Antarctica from the ship the Orlova to Neko Harbor. Her efforts to promote diplomacy and peace have included swims across the Berlin Strait, opening the US-Soviet border for the first time in 48 years across the Beagle Channel between Argentine and, Ch and Chile, across the Spree River between the newly united German republics, and through the Gulf of Aqaba from Egypt to Israel, and from Israel to Jordan, tracing the progress of peace between the three countries. She is the author of three books, Swimming to Antarctica, Grayson, and South with the Sun, the recipient of the Susan B. Anthony Award for Leadership, and she was inducted into the Swimming Hall of Fame in 2000. Dr. Gabriela Miato has a great love of nature, languages, human rights, dance, and poetry. In addition to her medical degree, she also holds a master's in public health and as a family physician, she has focused on community and integrative medicine and multicultural wellness practices in California and Alaska. Gabriella has also volunteered her time for humanitarian relief and development work in Latin America and the Balkans. Her poetry appears in pop art an anthology of Southern California poetry. She is also on staff at the Children's Clinic in Long Beach, California. With no further introductions, I'm proud to present our uh, guest lecturers tonight, Lynn Cox and Dr. Gabriella Mioto.
Hey, it works. <laughs> Good evening. I am very, very happy to be here at Iowa State and love that the temperatures have dropped so it feels like being in Antarctica again. <laughs> um, actually, I wanted to give you a little background on how I got into the sport of open water swimming and then became an author that focused on these different swims and adventures. My whole swimming career really began in Manchester, New Hampshire. I was swimming with the Manchester swim team and we were working out daily in the summertime at the Rako Theatre Pool, which was this 50 meter pool outside. And we had the best swimmers from Harvard University coming to train in the summertime with us. And it was an age group team that was training pretty much four hours a day. We had two hours of swimming and then two hours of calisthenics. And there was one day where it started raining and getting really cold. And the kids in the pool were messing around, throwing kickboards and splashing and diving under the lane lines. And so they were trying to convince Coach Merritt to let us out of the pool. And so finally he said, OK, I'll make a deal with you. If you guys get out and do four hours of calisthenics, I'll let you out of the pool. I'm like, ah, oh, there's no way I want to do four hours of calisthenics. Because when we did calisthenics, if we did 20 push-ups, if somebody messed up, then we'd have to start all over again. And there were two kids on the team that did that all the time. So I went to the coach and said, could I stay in the pool and swim? And he said, okay. And two of the older swimmers from Harvard, two of the guys said, good idea. Can we stay in the pool, coach, and swim too? And he said, okay. So we started swimming, and the wind picked up, the sky got black, the wind was gusting across the pool, so there were little waves going across the pool, and then it started raining really hard. Um, the water temperature probably dropped to 70 degrees, and the two swimmers from Harvard said, we're out of here. But I was having a blast. It was like I had this whole 50-meter pool to myself, and I was swimming through these waves, and I was having so much fun, and I didn't want to get out of the pool, but it started hailing. And it really hurt. I mean, I'm like, I, it's like these peas are being spun on your back and it hurts and you can see the pieces of ice floating on the water and I'm like, I'm trying to duck under the water so I can keep swimming so I don't have to go do calisthenics. And it's like, it's not working. I go down, I come back up, I get hit on the head, I get down. So I figured what I'll do is I'll climb in the gutters and hang out there. So I did that and I watched the storm rage across the water, kind of like you get here maybe, um, just these amazing storms. And there was thunder and lightning and stuff, but it was far enough away to not have to get out of the pool. I got back in and continued swimming for another couple hours, and the air temperature dropped about 50 degrees. One of the mothers on the team, who was named Mrs. Milligan, came running over to me with this towel, and her daughter was a woman named Joyce Milligan, who was the best girl swimmer on the team. So she came over to me and said, Lynn, aren't you cold? I'm like, no, I'm not. She goes, you know, you should be freezing. I go, well, it was, it was great. And she goes, you know, one day I'm gonna, I bet you're going to swim across the English Channel. And that idea stuck with me when I was nine years old. And what it told me, looking back at it now, is that what adults say to kids really matters. And how you affect somebody can be just within that one sentence, it can affect their entire life. But that idea stuck with me. My folks realized that my older brother and two sisters and I wanted to swim and we wanted to do well, but our coaching was kind of minimal in the winter time. We would have volunteer coaches. We'd swim in 20 yard pools that were overheated. We didn't have goggles initially when we first started out. So you come outside and you look up at the lights and you'd see these rainbows and your eyes would be like running all the time because of the chlorine. Anyway, my folks decided that we'd move us to California so we could train with the Olympic coach. And I remember it was like sort of like field of dreams. We went to this 50 meter pool in Long Beach, California, and it was where they had had the 1968 Olympic trials. We had arrived there in 1969, so it was like a brand new facility. And we looked at this place going, and actually my dad took us from the airport to the swimming pool first before we even moved into our new home. And, and so the next day we started workout. And it was just amazing because I was in lane eight, the slowest lane, and all the best swimmers were in lane one. And there were swimmers from all around the world. And so I don't know why I was telling 
coach and swimmer here today, yesterday, that uh, you know I didn't, I wasn't intimidated. I would go over to them and say to the guy that would would win the 400 meter I am, a guy named Hans Fosch, uh, Gunnar Larsson from Sweden. Could you watch my butterfly, huh? Gunnar? And Gunnar would watch my butterfly, and then I would talk to Hans Foschnut, who who would do the 1650 free and the 1500 and get a silver medal for Germany in the 76 Olympic Games. And I'd say, Hans, would you watch my flip turns? And Hans would watch my flip turns and I'd ask him will you show me how you swim and these guys were like in their early 20s and I'm 14 years old and they're showing me how they swim so it's like the coolest thing in the world because what I learned then was that people who are great are willing to help other people because they're not just great athletes they're great people and so that was something that I carried with me that whenever I really want to do something important I need to look for somebody who can do it a lot better than me and learn from them so that was sort of that stuck into my head then as time went by, I worked out for two years with this team in Long Beach, California, with the best swimmers in the world. And Coach Gamble was one of the best coaches in the world. He wound up coaching four Olympic, U.S. Olympic teams. And one day he said to me, "Is you know, Lynn, you have this ability at the end of the workout to go further. You always seem to have more energy. And I think that you're kind of getting bored here in the swimming pool. There's no mile for in the Olympics for women. There's not even an 800 freestyle. So why don't you think about swimming the three-mile race off Seal Beach? And that was when I was 14 years old. And so I asked him what it was like. And basically the objective was would you start from shore, you swim along the Seal Beach Pier, swim out to this oil rig, around a buoy, and swim back into shore. And that would be three miles. So I said I'd love to do it. And I remember entering the race that day and going to the beach and starting off from shore and hitting the water dead last because I couldn't run worth anything. And then diving under the waves and I was like still dead last. And I kept swimming and as I started getting into the water and going through the waves and looking around me and feeling the bounce and the lift of the water around me and looking at the sunshine and seeing the seagulls flying by and suddenly these pelicans coming by and flying like inches from my head. Head, I was just like, this is so cool. And as I swam, I started picking up my speed. And then all of those kids that had passed me up in workout, that were the sprinters, were sort of falling behind. And for once, I could see myself doing really well. So I wound up doing going around the buoy at the at the at the half mile mark, way offshore, and then coming back toward shore and picking up speed. And my mom and dad were standing on the pier cheering me on. And I kept going and wound up coming in first in the women's group and third in the men. And that day, I heard about a group of kids that had been training for a year. There was one 12-year-old and four 14-year-olds who were planning to swim across the Catalina Channel. And Catalina Channel, here's my PowerPoint. Um, here's Catalina Island, and here's the mainland of California. In a straight line, it's 21 miles. Um, back then, we didn't have GPS, and the navigators that were navigating for us used radar. So instead of swimming a straight line, you would swim this inverted S course. We started from Catalina Island at midnight because the wind is down at that time. And we had lifeguards from the local Seal, Bo Seal Beach Lifeguard Department and Long Beach Lifeguard Department. And then we had two boats that were way off in front of us. And the reason they were way off in front of us, like a quarter of a mile ahead of us, is because they had a lot of light on the boat. And, and we didn't want to have a lot of light near us because if you have a lot of light, you can have a lot of fish. And if you can have a lot of fish, then you can attract bigger fish. And you don't want bigger fish when you're swimming across Catalina Channel. So we set off at midnight. The water was pitch black. And, and it was a little bit disorienting because you're going into this area where the water's black, the sky's black, everything as your hand enters the water. It starts out to be black, but then as you pull through the water, you see these contrails of lights, of sparks streaming off your fingertips. And the whole area sort of illuminates like phosphorescence around you. As it continued swimming, you could see these flying fish leaping out of the water toward the lights of the boats in the distance, and you could see them turning pinks and purples and greens. Um, it was just this amazing contact with nature. But the other thing was that we had these paddle boards that were next to us where there was a little bit of flashlight light on them. And they were going, going dull because the batteries weren't very strong. And, and so it was really hard to keep track of where we were positioned in the water. So what I did is I started looking up at the stars. 
And that was amazing because suddenly you're away from shore and you can see the entire canopy of sky above you illuminated as points of light. And you could see shooting stars and you could see different color stars and you could see the Mars and Venus. And I'm swimming along and as time is going on, you can see the constellation moving across the heavens. And so, so instead of trying to watch a watch, which you couldn't anyway, you could just sort of tell that there had been time passing. About four hours into the swim, one of our teammates, Nancy Dale, had gone into hypothermia and had to be pulled out. And it was like that was probably the lowest point of the swim because we had agreed doing the swim together. And to see one of our teammates getting pulled out, it was really awful. But at the same time, I think it made us realize that we would stick it out, we would do this together. There was one point about five hours into the swim where my coach said, you know what, you are so strong that you can go and break the men's and women's world record. So why don't you just leave Nancy and Andy and Dale and Stacy behind and, and go for the record. And I thought about it and I thought, no, I can't do that because they let me train with their team. I, you know, I was privileged to be able to do this with them and we had decided that no matter what we would stay together. So because I was faster I'd get about a mile ahead and tread water and then wait for them to catch up and then swim with them for a while and then I'd get ahead and finally in 12 hours and 36 minutes we made it to shore. Um, my friends and I were lying down on the shore sort of shivering and trying to warm up for about an hour and then we had to walk these cliffs in Palos Verdes up to, the, to where the parent, our parents had the parking, lot, the parking lot for the car. Got back home, we had used lanolin which is this sticky substance that's made from the wool of sheep and we smelled really bad and the stuff you just, just wanted to get it off. So the only way that really worked was to take a whole thing of dishwasher detergent, squirt it all over me and then and sit in a bathtub and watch these cakes of grease come off. Um, and later on I learned that you don't want to do that, you don't want to wear this lanolin because it's made from the wool of sheep and it could attract fish that you don't want swimming with you. So anyway, I sat in the bathtub and, and, and floated and thought about, wow, you know, we were the first group of kids to swim 27 miles across the Catalina Channel and we did it. And, and we had all these people that helped us, but we made it. And so I thought, I want to swim across the English Channel. So the next morning I went to my mom and dad and said, hey, will you help me swim across the English Channel? And they said, yes. So the next day I went back to Coach Gambrel and said, would you help me train to swim across the English Channel? Um, and he said, you know, I've never coached anyone to swim the channel before. And I said, that's okay, coach, I've never done it before. So what he did is he took these workouts that he had done, he'd worked with and through the Olympic swimmers and applied them to open water swimming for me. And what happened was there was one day where I was training and my mom was walking me, with me between five and ten miles a day and there was a woman named Helen Olsen who had grown up in Norway and her daughter was a swimmer on the team but she liked to come out and walk the beach with my mom and she walked and talked the whole way and I remember her talking about Raul Amundsen and how Raul Amundsen was the first man to reach the South Pole and how amazing he was because he was able to endure this journey and the cold that went like below minus 40 degrees and so I thought this man must be really exceptional and she kept telling me these things about you are like Amundsen because you have this endurance and you can go fast and you will swim across the English Channel and again this wasn't my mom telling me this was my friend's mom who was encouraging me to do this and that sat in my head and so when I went to England with my mom um, you hire a pilot to go along with you there's a list of names you can choose from you get somebody from the English Channel Swimming Association and you set off at midnight usually again because it's the air's calmer so there's less the water's not choppy and you start off we we set off from shore and I was really excited because from all the way back from being nine years old to now 15 years old it was my goal to swim the channel but the other thing was that my goal also was to break the men's and women's world records. So started offshore, got probably about halfway across, 
And I started noticing that there were things floating around me. And, and they felt like the water was pitch black and I couldn't really see. And, and it was like, this went on for like 100 yards, 200 yards. I kept thinking these things were all around me like heads floating. And finally, I turned to the pilot on the boat and I yelled and said, Reg, what is in the water? He said, oh, a ship just went by and it dumped off a bunch of lettuce heads. You're swimming through lettuce heads. <laughs> you know, it just doesn't, these things do things to your mind when you're in black water alone swimming. Well, years and years later, my friend, John York, would do a swim across the English Channel, and he would get within a mile of shore, and he said he knew he had gotten within a mile of shore because a ship had dumped a whole bunch of croissants, and he was swimming through hundreds and hundreds of yards of croissants, and he said he was so hungry that he thought he might pick one up and eat it, but decided that was probably a bad idea. <laughs> you know, when you do these swims, you do get hungry, and, and you, you go through these periods of, I think I can do this, and then you're tired, and you're talking to yourself, and you just keep going, and you try to keep going at a pace. Back then, my dad was a doctor, so he had suggested that I try all different things out before I do the swim. And, and so what I wound up doing is every hour or so, I would have some water, or I would have some apple juice, or I'd have oatmeal raisin cookie. Um, the apple juice was something that I could warm up that would put energy back into me, but when you swim for six, seven, eight, ten hours, your, stro your throat gets really swollen and the salt water is really abrasive. So kept swimming through the day into the night, and one of the most difficult things about swimming in this channel is that when you are usually a mile from shore, the tide changes. And it's like running a marathon and then seeing the finish line moving backwards. So at that point, if you've been swimming for hours and you've been trying to keep a pace, it's that point where you have to start sprinting. And so I just remember my mom like on the boat crying and the official observer telling me I've got to sprint and the guy that's piling the boat, Reg Brick, will say, you've got to go now, otherwise you're not going to make it in through the tide. And so you sprint and you sprint and you sprint and if you've got a great pilot, and I did, he was able to work his way through the current. And I started making headway, and then I'd get thrown back again and watch the finish line go backwards again and kept going. And they were watching the time all the time and, and basically knowing that I had been four hours ahead of the men's and women's world record, but that time was getting eaten up. Um, finally got within the shores, and, and there was an area where it was all rocks, and that was like now 200 yards from where we were. And and there was a beach that was another mile away. There was a surge, swell, slamming against the rocks. And so it was like, do you want to go for the rocks or do you want to go for the beach? And it's like, do you want to go for the record or do you want to go for the sand? So I went for the <laughs> rocks. And it was just like, oh. You know, again, when you've been swimming really hard for hours on hours, you're, you're tired. I mean, it may be like when you've worked on a farm in Iowa for hours and hours and you're exhausted at the end of the day, but then you still have to do more and have that surge of energy. That was sort of where I was, but continued, figured out a way to get in before the surge, sort of, and then sort of get slammed a little bit against the rocks and climbed out. And there were three people on the cliffs in, in Cape Grenay looking down on us, and they yelled in French, Tu nage la manche? And I had been practicing all night long. Oui, je nage la manche. And it was like, yes, I swam the channel. And you could hear the three people clapping. <laughs> And then I, I got back down and sort of got slammed around on the rocks again, but get down back into the water, swam out to this dory where they take a towel and they lift it, put it under your arms, and then they hoist you, or they try to, but if you're covered with lanolin, as I was that time, um, they sort of keep dropping you in the water and eventually they get you into the boat. Well, the official observer who had been on many swims was on the boat crying, and I'm like, Mickey, did I make it? Like, did I break the record. And he couldn't talk. And I'm like, come on, did I do it? And he said, yes, yes, love. You broke the woman's time by about an hour and the men's time by about 20 minutes. And he was going to go back and check it all. So um, basically, at age 15, I had succeeded at my biggest goal in life. And I then flew back to California with my mom to go back to high school and sort of went through a midlife crisis. Now what do you do when you've achieved your highest goal in life at age 15? 
But I was really, really lucky because there was a man named Davis Hart from Springfield, Massachusetts, who was an open water swimmer, who went to England and broke my record. Um, so the following year, I went back again. And the first time I swam the English Channel, I swam 30 miles. The second time I swam, and I swam 33 miles. And I broke his time by 20 minutes. And as time goes by, you meet people that you don't expect to meet through time. And I was at, a, at an open water swimming race off of Alcatraz. And this young man came over to me and said, do you know Davis Hart? And I said, yes. He said, well, you know, he was my coach. And I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, you know the day that you broke his record? I said, yeah. He was so mad at you. <laughs> and, like, and I said, yeah, I know. I know how he feels. <laughs> and so, but what you also learn is there's a time when you do these things and there's a time where you go beyond what you've done and where you want to do something more. And there are people that go and swim the English Channel. There's a woman named Allison Streeter who has swum the English Channel 43 times. But I figured that I wanted to do something more than that. And I had met a swimmer from New Zealand who had said, why don't you think about swimming Cook Straits, PowerPoint again. Um, the North Island to the South Island of New Zealand is, is 10 miles. So I figured at the worst, I mean, if it's a bad day, this 10 mile swim is going to take me five hours to swim. So I thought that would be a really exciting thing to do, to try to be the first woman to do it. There had been three men before. Went to New Zealand, worked with a crew there, set off with a support team. Um, after five hours of swimming, we were further from the finish than we had started. The current had carried us back around the North Island. And um, the weather was really bad. The wind was between 40 and 45 knots. You guys know weather here in Iowa. <laughs> so it was just really depressing. But what happened was Air New Zealand that flew between the North and South Islands of New Zealand changed the course of their aircraft so they could show their support and they could radio down the weather information to us. I kept swimming. The Aratika ferry that went between the two islands, about halfway, when I started making progress, about halfway across, the Aratika came over and raised the American flag, and everyone on board came out to cheer us on. Um, kept, kept swimming. The surf got between the waves in, in the middle channel of Cook Strait, got between six and eight feet high. Um, and I'd never swum in conditions like that before. But then the dolphins came. And this is like the most coolest thing in the world because the water there is sort of the color of your shirt, this beautiful, beautiful blue. And you could swim along and see forever. And you could see dolphins below dolphins below dolphins. And suddenly there were a couple. And actually the, there was a guy named Robbie on a pile over beside me. And he goes, watch this, watch this. And so I'm watching. And suddenly these two dolphins leap out of the water in front of us. And that is like the signal. And then there's all these other dolphins that are leaping and then they're twirling in front of us. I'm like, oh, this is incredible. And so for an hour, you could hear them clicking and squeaking and playing, and you could see them coming from behind and around. And their boats were around us, so they were entertaining everybody all around. So I continued swimming six hours, seven hours, eight hours. Around nine hours, I was like going through a bad period again. Dolphins reappeared. Ten hours, bad period. Eleven hours, bad period. The dolphins would, ar would arrive again. The sun started to set behind the South Island, and it created a shadow on the water. And we were about two miles from the finish of the swim, and the pilot, John Cataldo, was telling me, you need to swim faster now. I'm like, John, I'm like, really? I'm doing my best. He goes, no, no, it's shark feeding time now, and there's lots of sharks. They're great pointers, and so you really need to hurry up and finish the swim. I'm like, OK. Well, at that point, when we were about 400 yards from finally finishing the swim, eight more dolphins came in. And they came right next to the two paddlers on either side of me. And you could see them right below the surface of the water. And their clicks and squeaks had gotten very high pitched. And there were fishermen from the South Island that moved their boats out to come and point us to where to go to get into shore. And the dolphins were going this way. And the fishermen were sort of pointing that way. And I thought, go with the dolphins, because they know this probably better. So we follow the dolphins. The tide was really shifting. There were these great big strands of bull kelp, which are thick, ropey pieces of kelp. And so I just pulled on the kelp and wound up getting to shore. Um, the swim took 12 hours and two and a half minutes. Um, and I realized that you stay in there through the whole thing. You finish what you set out to do. And, and 
the bigger thing was that I was just a swimmer and I wasn't from New Zealand, but I had people from this country who had been following the swim throughout the day on the radio that had been cheering me on and that's what really got me across. So that next day to celebrate the swim, church bells were rung throughout the country. And it made me once again feel like, wow, an American in New Zealand and people really care and, and they were they were so great. Went back home, back to high school, and um, <laughs> was trying to figure out what to do with the rest of my life again. Um, and so my dad pulled out a map of, of Alaskan Siberia. Alaskan Siberia. In the middle of this area is the Bering Strait. And very, almost in the center of the Bering Strait is Little Diomede and Big Diomede. The United States is Little Diomede back then. I mean, Little, Little Diamond's United States, Big Diamond was the Soviet Union, now it's, now it's called Russia. So my dad said, why don't you think about swimming from the United States to the Soviet Union as a way to show that the two superpowers are 2.7 miles apart. This was during the Cold War. And this idea was just like so far ahead of its time. But I started thinking about it and thought, you know, maybe this would be possible. So. I started training. My brother went to Nome and to Wales, Alaska, talked to the Inuit. We started trying to figure out how to coordinate a swim. Um, the difficulty in, the, in that swim was that the water temperature was going to be 38 degrees. Um, and I would be planning to swim with just a bathing suit cap and goggles. Um, I spent 11 years trying to get support to do the swim. I wrote to the US ambassador to the Soviet Union, the Soviet ambassador to the United States, the um, assistant secretary of state, the secretary of state, the president, the head of the foreign ministry, senators, congressmen, people who had done business in the Soviet Union, Armin Hammer, actually it was Armin Hammer's office that introduced me to the Soviet consulate in San Francisco. I went there and the door opened a little bit and then kept trying and trying and trying and finally um, a day before the swim happened we got the approval from Gorbachev. Um, so with a, with a team of Inuit in 30 foot long walrus skin boats, we set off in the fog to cross the border and to meet up with the Soviet boats at the border. On board were two doctors, one from the University of London, who was the world's expert on hypothermia, and there was another doctor named Jan Nybor, who was from University of Alaska. And what they had had me do was to swallow a thermal pill which was a, a, a pill that, you would, that has a radio frequency in it that would transmit my, my core temperature to a receiver on board the boat. And so that way they could monitor my temperature and they hoped that it were, would work, but the actual, what actually happened was that in the salt water the signal dissipated and they couldn't get my temperature. So they would have me roll over my back and they would hold the receiver attached to a broomstick <laughs> held near my stomach to try to get my core temperatures. And they weren't getting accurate readings. So at one point I just sort of said, you know, it's really more important to make the swim than it is to get body temperatures. So I sort of said, I just got to swim. So we continued on. Um, the fog started to lift. We were about 400 yards from shore. The water temperature had dropped to 38 degrees. Um, there was a skiff coming from the south toward us and there was a man named Vladimir McMillan, I'd find out, yelling at us, waving his arms and saying, my name is Vladimir McMillan. I'm from TASS. I'm with the Russian, the Soviets. We are here to welcome you. Um, but they can't land there because it's a cliff. Can you swim a half, an, a half a mile down the beach, see where those people are standing on the snowbank? Because if you can swim there, they will be able to welcome you to shore. And you're thinking, the water's 38 degrees. I'm really cold. I really, really want to finish. But, but the whole point was about reaching out to the Soviets and hoping that they would reach back. And so. We paralleled the shore um, and went a half a mile and I climbed out on the snowbanks and I heard two guys in Soviet military uniforms talking to me in Russian and like, we made it. You know, after 11 years of trying to get permission, the border was open. And then a few months later, when Gorbachev and Reagan were signing the INF Missile Treaty, Gorbachev, President Gorbachev stood up and said it took a daring American girl by the name of Lynn Cox just two hours to swim between our two countries. He said it showed how close to each other the two countries are and how our relations were improving. And so it made me realize that, yes, you know, we can make a difference in this world. We can do things that are symbolic. We can help to create 
things where we connect with each other and network, work with each other around the world. So from there I would go on to do other swims that were really challenging. And, and then um, I would start thinking about, you know, how could I do something that's further than anything I've done before, something that would challenge me, me more than anything ever, and how could I continue doing this research with these doctors on the cold and hypothermia. So I was talking to a friend of mine named Caroline Alexander who had written a book called Endurance. And it was about Shackleton and his attempt to get to actually across the Antarctic continent. But he got snowed, well, locked in in the ice and he had to be, re he, he was able to get all of his men offshore and they were rescued. And she wrote this great book about his great leadership. But in the back of my mind I thought, wait a second, Amundsen was the first guy to reach the South Pole. Shackleton tried to get to the South Pole. He didn't get across Antarctica. He didn't even get onto the continent, really. Why is he so great? So that sort of stuck in my head, like, I think it may be time at some point to write about Amundsen. So what happened then was that I started looking at nature to figure out how can you do a swim in a bathing suit cap and goggles in Antarctic waters. And I looked at the penguins. And, you know, we all love penguins. They're sort of squatty bodied. If you're tall, you lose a lot of body heat really rapidly. If you're shorter, you contain body heat better. So penguins are small. They've got a well distribution of body fat. They also have an air area between their body fat and their feathers. And so I thought, you know what I'm going to do for the swim in Antarctica is I'm going to grow my hair really long. I'm going to pile it up on my head and I'm not squishing the hat down. So I create this area that will keep my head a little bit warmer. People lose 80% of heat through their head. So I figured, okay, the other thing I'll do is I'll swim like a water polo player. I'll swim head up. But the way I'll train for it will be different. I'll train like a sprinter. I'll work on developing upper body strength. I'll work at a very high rate to create enough heat to compensate for swimming in water temperatures that would be 32 degrees. So I trained and worked with a wrestling coach to figure out how to work on balance too because I figured that swimming is also about balance and if I can balance better on land I might be able to balance better in the water um, and pull more equally with my arms and swim more efficiently. So for two years I worked on this idea and on this swim and then wound up going to Antarctica to do the swim. But before I went, I wound up contacting a group of friends that were physicians to go along with me. Because the problem with swimming in water that cold is that you have a nerve in your nose called the vagus nerve. And if you overstimulate it, if you jump into very cold water, you can flatline. You can go into cardiac arrest. So I needed to have people around me that would be there in case something bad happened. But also, when you swim in water that cold, you're swimming and creating heat for a certain amount of time, but you could lose too much body heat and go into hypothermia. Or at the end of the swim, when you're no longer exercising, the cool blood from the outside of your body can go into your core and cool your core down too quickly. So it was really important that I had doctors with me. I also had friends um, who came just to be there in three different Zodiac boats. And one of them was a man named Bob Griffith who'd grown up in Nebraska. And minutes before, well maybe an hour before I was going to do the swim, we were thinking about things that we would do in case they needed to put me out of the water quickly. And what I did is I had a string that I tied on the back through my suit that somebody could jump in and grab as a handhold. But that, I could have still had problems or, or sunk if you go into cardiac arrest. So what we did was we were talking to each other and Bob just happened to mention that he was a, cow, he was a champion cow roper from Nebraska. So we decided that what we would do is put Bob in the lead Zodiac boat with a lasso. And we would stand in the Zodiac boat with him wearing a dry suit so that if I had a problem, the first thing Dan would do is jump in in the dry suit, swim over to me and try to grab that handhold. But if that didn't work, then Bob would take his lasso and throw it and then Dan would loop it over me and then pull me out of the water. So we went ahead, went to Ushuaia, Argentina at the very tip of South America. Then from there we went by ship from the very tip of South America to, to the peninsula of Antarctica. We sailed for two and, a half day, two and a half days south. The water conditions were awful. The waves were consistently 30 feet high. Um, and we would look at the porthole of, the, of our cabin room and it felt like we were inside a washing machine looking out. It was just really hard to, to 
be comfortable. <laughs> and most of the people on board the boat were really sick. Um, after we got down to Antarctica, we spent pretty much half a day looking for a place where I could do the swim where there weren't icebergs. Because if you swim around icebergs, they can move and they can fall on you and, and hurt your crew or you. So we had to find a place that was without ice. Also, we had to make sure that everyone knew that we needed to stay away from the glaciers. And we had been talking about, from, from the very start of the swim, we didn't want to get close to the glaciers because they can break off, become icebergs, and, and fall on the crew or injure some of us. So we wound up planning to do a swim far away from the glaciers and set up the swim and did this in 2002. And so what I'm going to do now is have Gabriella come on up here um, to basically show you some of the background of the, of the Antarctic swim. And then, because her photos are amazing, and she shot them for the New Yorker. And then I'm going to go ahead and show you the Antarctic swim that 60 Minutes captured. Thank you. So I thought I would start with um, with a poem, um, because this really makes me think of Lynn and the way she melts things, you know, things that paralyze us. Um, she is about kind of breaking through paralysis. So I call this O to Solutio. If the glacier around my heart melts, I will have buckets of water to quench my thirst. No longer parched, I will know the power of salt water in my veins to navigate the oxbow current back towards my true home. Holding steady against riptides, tumbling with waterfalls over weathered cliffs of both my own and nature's making, and marveling at the pool of lapis lazuli seahorses below. Drinking from the river of change and the deep well of memory, I will splash in foaming waves, buoyed by ocean and wonder, holding fast to the palm and the eye of the storm. I will behold icicles whose sharpness transforms in the sun, learn to be both pelagic and demersal, move with a labyrinth of eddies, cut my hands at the Delphi spring in the liquid realm of Pisces, float in sweet water lake, and I'm really sorry, but I forgot my glasses, and I can't read the last line. <laughs> Float in a sweet water lake and rush in a torrent from peaks ah, to melt. So for you, Lynn. So Lynn, you know, Lynn talks about what one does alone, but what one does really through teamwork. And so this photo is to kind of represent that aspect. And this was in Ushuaia, Argentina. And she was working with uh, people from the Navy to practice her swims before actually getting to Antarctica. And this maybe sets the scene a little bit for you. You know, this, the beauty of Antarctica takes really took my breath away, and I think that it it's, has that kind of effect on most people who see it. But you can see the color of the water and those huge icebergs, and just the way the sky is such an unusual kind of silver. And then, you know, you think, well, the Arctic is, is like ice and snow floating, but Antarctica is actually continent. So here's this massive piece of land. And I really loved this um, particular image because it almost made me think of an animal rising up out of the water with its, uh, with its ears there. Um, <laughs> with my background as a physician, I was also very moved by the beauty of ice that really made me think of anatomy. And this made me actually think of Lynn, because you know, think of brain, brain stem and spinal cord. And I was thinking about the power in her body to move forward. And um, this, this piece spoke to me of that, of her power. So she mentioned penguins to you. These happen to be the chin straps, and I love these because if you look at them, it almost looks like they're wearing a little a little hat or a little a swimmer's <laughs> a swimmer's cap. With the when we used to also have the thing under our chins there. So the beauty of the chin strap penguins. And then of course there's always that aspect that that Lynn brings up of really knowing your environment. And here one of the things that would have been a danger to her were the leopard seals. And uh, so we were keeping close eye on those as she did her swims. And don't be fooled by the smile. <laughs> so here is Lynn leaving the Orlova, the, the ship that we were on, for what was going to be the test swim. 
And, uh, you know, you can see the others dressed very heavily. And there's Lynn, as she mentioned, no lanolin, beautiful blue suit because she didn't want to wear black or red or white and be mistaken for um, a tasty morsel. So, <laughs> beautiful suit. And this is a moment before jumping into that water. And there she is, swimming during the test swim. Notice the color of the water. You know, she had talked about how stormy it was, so this was uh, uh, an appropriate time to be swimming. But I, 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 whenever I look at these pictures, I feel again the, the wind and the, the, the cold. One thing that Lynn did um, as well, you know, how do you communicate? Well, you communicate in many ways trying to see how she's doing in that water, seeing if her fingers were splaying, that was a, would be a sign of danger, seeing if she was really slowing down or seeming to be uncoordinated, another, another sign. If she had had a lot of blue over her shoulders, another sign. But this was great because this was Lynn's way, lifting her leg out of the water to say, I'm okay. And she would do this periodically during the swim. So the penguins, you know, she talked about the beauty of the penguins swimming with her. And it really was something to see them um, uh, right there with her, next to her. We didn't see as much under her, but she has some wonderful stories about that. And then the ones on shore, too, is like they were standing there going, oh, my God, did we see what we thought we just saw? <laughs> and these are the Gen 2, so a different kind of penguin down there. Okay, so this is Lynn actually on the brink of her Antarctic mile swim. So she did really two major swims, but this is the one where she broke the mile mark. And you can see her coming down the stairs there. Um, very cold day. Again, notice everyone else how they're dressed. So air and water were both 32 degrees on that day, Fahrenheit. And here she is the moment before slipping into water, which she describes in her book like a liquid snow cone. <laughs> and also she mentioned the water was very sweet, um, possibly because it was glacial melt, so a different kind of, of salt water. And again, the idea of her support team, people in two different zodiacs um, right with her, needing to look out for dangerous hunks of ice. And she mentioned that uh, her normal speed was just over um, two knots. And when she would see the penguins swimming underneath her, they were going, she felt at least 10 miles an hour. I think you said 15, right, Dylan? Yeah. So here she is. She, on that day, completed 1.06 Antarctic nautical miles, about 1.22 miles in 25 minutes in 32 degree water. And there she is, no lanolin, you know. Uh, basically bathing suit, green this time. And uh, I just love this shot. It's, um, I don't know, it seems to me to catch, it, catch her essence. I think this speaks of, I used red because it speaks of the heat. She generates heat when she swims, but, and she generates a lot of heat in friendships. So Lynn Cox, extraordinary athlete, diplomat, author, woman of heart and courage and friend. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So now what we're going to do is actually go to the final swim and show you what it entailed to do that swim. And actually, the key is that I do these swims, but they're never done alone. That I, People think of me as a solo athlete, but I could never put myself out there without having Gabriella on board the boat and people watching me and knowing that if something goes wrong, they'll be there to get me out. Um, there's a lot of trust that goes both ways. So we'll go ahead and show the, it's about 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, thanks a lot. Thank you. 
So to, so to sum it up and to connect it to the writing part, I really wanted to share these stories. And I wanted to share these stories about people who extended themselves to help me, people that have helped me do swims around the Cape of Good Hope, Strace Magellan. And so I started working on my, my senior year of college at UC Santa Barbara. I had actually my freshman year, I had a poetry professor who said, Lynn, you can write. Why don't you think about writing something? And so my senior year of college, I took some creative writing classes. And one of the creative writing instructors doctor said, I, I will help you work on whatever you want to work on. And so I said, I want to write a book. So Swimming to Antarctica was my first book, and it only took 21 years to get published. Um, it became number 13, 13 on the New York Times bestseller list. And then I worked on Grayson for about a year, and it took another year to get it published. And that made number seven on the New York Times list, very briefly, but it made it. And that's been translated into 18 different languages. From there, I went on to just Decide that, hey, remember that story about Raul Amundsen and, and how he inspired you? Well, I decided that he'd been, for, he'd been sort of overlooked. People had done books on Shackleton and on Scott, but nobody had written about Amundsen. So for the last seven years, I spent working on a book about him because it's the 100-year anniversary of his achievement of the South Pole. And it was so important because he did things that nobody else did in terms of researching, figuring out how to do it, looking at all the early explorers that came before him, and then he trained harder than any of the others. And so I looked at these elements, I studied his letters, and, and one of the key things is that I found that he had a mentor named Fridjof Nansen who was extraordinary. And he went to Fridjof Nansen and said, would you help me? And Nansen said yes, and he helped teach him all he knew, taught him about science, taught him about navigation. And then Amundsen went out, and when he did collections of water samples, he brought them back for Nansen. And then from there on, Amundsen went on to make it to the South Pole. But when he came back and went to Norway, and he was waiting for Robert, Admiral Byrd to land after his first flight to the North Pole, they had dinner together, and Amundsen sat down and explained to Admiral Byrd what he needed to do to reach the South Pole. So within writing the story, I kept seeing how great people will look at other worthy people and hand down what they've learned to the next person to allow that person to go further. And so I decided to write this book in a way that a reader, the book that I'm talking about is South with the Sun, that a reader could read what Amundsen did and what Nansen did and be inspired by their achievements, by their research, by what they found, discovered, who they inspired, how they all survived. They could look at these men and see all that, but then they could follow who they inspired. And part of our ability now for exploration was in Antarctica was first because of bird flying there, but also because of a man named Gus Shin, who was the first man to fly and land at the South Pole. So I went to Pensacola, Florida, and interviewed him about what it was like to land on the continent for the first time and the challenges he had to get the aircraft back into the air. And then from there, I talked to people in the Navy who then con continued that mission and then from there went on to fly the US, the US Air Force went on to fly that mission. And so I collected some of their stories because they are now filling Amundsen's vision that the way of exploring Antarctica in the future is through flight. And what I'm trying to do in December of this year is go to Antarctica with a small group of people who are connected to Antarctic exploration to celebrate Amundsen's achievement because our South Pole Station is called the Amundsen-Scott South Pole Station, but also to celebrate the U.S. military that are flying the missions into Antarctica that are opening up the continent and exploration in ways that we did with our country. but as unexplored as our country was at one point, Antarctica still is. And that's why it was so exciting to talk to the people, the men and women in the Air Force, who are flying into places nobody's ever gone before. And one of the things that was so cool to find out was when Amundsen went there, he shot the sun to navigate. And on December 14, 1911, he thought he reached the South Pole with his crew. And he shot the sun and did measurements and realized that he didn't make it. In Norway, they celebrate the 14th of December as the day that he arrived at the South Pole. But he was so pragmatic, and he wanted to be so sure that he reached it, that he continued south for three more days, which was huge because 
that put him and his crew at more risk of, of not surviving the journey back. And they reached the South Pole on December 17th, 1911. The Norwegians celebrate the 14th, and I'm like, now what do I do? I've gone back to the original documents, and Amundsen's saying, I didn't get there until the 17th. And the archive librarians are telling me it's the 14th. So a friend of mine who's a swimmer, who's a cartographer, created the map in the beginning of my book and of the Arctic and the Antarctic in the back of the book. And I kept thinking, how do I do this? Because if he hadn't pushed on for three more days and reached the South Pole on the 17th of December, when Robert Falcon Scott came through a month later, he would have been the first to get to the South Pole. But instead, he saw Amundsen's flag and the tent there. So it was like he had to do what he did to achieve what he did. But once again, it showed the character of this person that no matter what, he would go all the way. He would never go short of the, of the goal. And so on the chart, in the back of the book, we have the day Amundsen thought he reached the pole, the day he confirmed that he reached the South Pole. And that way it was able to cover both, both sides of it. Um, and, and so my reason for doing these swims is to sort of push out there to see what we can do, to go beyond what we've ever done before, to find inspiration from others, to draw upon that, to help other people achieve their goals, and then to be able to write about these experiences. And I think one of the, one of the most, ex, you know, one of the most ex exciting experiences was coming ashore in Antarctica and seeing the penguins on the glacier walking down and then jumping up, jumping into the water. And then Gabrielle was mentioning that you could look down through the water and see them flying through the water. And there would be pods of between six and eight that were were coming right underneath me and rolling over and looking at me. And you could see the streams of bubbles coming off their beaks. And then they'd move off and another flock would come down. And, and at the end of the clip there you saw from 60 Minutes, they literally were all standing on shore. The Adelis were standing on shore and just like squawking away as if, welcome to Antarctica. <laughs> Anyway, I'd like to thank you all very much for coming here tonight. And um, if you might have a couple questions, we have just a tiny little bit of time. And then I'm going to be over there signing books if you choose to get a book that you want signed. Um, do any of you have any questions? Or just yell at me. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Yes. In Antarctica, I was, uh, let's see, two days before my, four, oh, two weeks before my 46th birthday. Yeah, and that was, at that point, that was the most difficult thing I've ever done. But since then, I followed in Amundsen's wake through the Northwest Passage to write that story to bring it to present day time. So I did swims off of Greenland that were 28.8, that dropped down to 26.6, and then Baffin Island, um, through the ice, and that was 28.8. That was a mile, so that was very challenging. But I think a lot of it, too, is that, you know, it's so much fun to, to look at these things that you just go, this is not possible. And then you think, well, maybe it could be. And then how could I do it? And then how can I get a group of people around me, like Gabriella and, and Barry and other people that, and Susan Scar, the people that you saw in those clips who will come and help do this? Because it really takes that kind of team to be able to push out there. And I remember on the second swim that I did through the Northwest Passage, we were flying in um, from the southern part of Baffin Island. And as we did this turn in this small aircraft to land on the airstrip that was just a wooden, um, a rough um, dirt airstrip, I looked down at the ocean and saw that it was still all frozen over. And I'm thinking, oh, wow, this one's going to be a hard swim. <laughs> it's like, and then, though, we had to wait like set nine days for the ice to break. And I kept thinking, oh my gosh, 
These explorers spent months in the Arctic or in the Antarctic waiting for the ice to break. And at least we were at the end of the spring season, it was actually May, and, and it, it started breaking enough to do a swim, but I couldn't use Zodiac boats because they couldn't fit through the narrow passage of ice. So we had a guy in a kayak with a, a long rope with a carabiner on the back of it. And I had a harness that friends of mine helped develop from the Coast Guard and rock climbers. And it was just a flat strapped harness with a carabiner on the back. So that if something went wrong, he could clamp onto me and then just drag me back to shore. Um, but it, it is amazing to be swimming you know, in areas where there are penguins and see them and to look into water that looks like the sky and you can see forever and realize that the human body is really, really fragile, but it's also really resilient and strong. And so much of what we can do is, is limited by what we think we can do. And once we can get beyond that, then other things come into possibility, you know. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, one more, one more. <laughs> Do I still swim? Yes, I still swim, and I have something that I'm thinking about um, once I am back home for a while and I can get back into training seriously. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.